uh, record. All right, thank you. All right, well, welcome to our uh, monthly, uh, once again, uh, virtual breakfast. Um, uh, we're gonna be this way until, until the science tells us uh, to not, but uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, no particular order as they appear on my screen. I want to uh, uh, recognize Congressman Scott, uh, 100th candidate, Fanal Norton, uh, Commissioner of Revenue, uh, Blythe Scott. Um, we'll get to our guest. Uh, let's see, uh, Delegate Jay Jones is uh, on. Hey, Jay. Um, and I know uh, uh, Delegate uh, Williams Graves was on. I don't know if she dropped off. She should be coming back on. Uh, Commonwealth Attorney uh, Raman Patahi. And if I missed any of our elected officials, I will get to you. And uh, again, because it is Labor Day, we also want to uh, uh, give special acknowledgement to uh, uh, folks who are involved in the labor movement on our committee. Uh, we have some uh, great members. Uh, shout out to uh, uh, Nick Jones, who's with the Teamsters. Um, uh, uh, Larry Brown, of course, president of the firefighters. Uh, Kim Brown with the, uh, uh, do they, can you, is it still Longshoreman? I guess Longshoreman, uh, no matter. But uh, uh, Kim, uh, Phil Hawkins, uh, president of the Norfolk uh, NEA. And I don't know if he's on yet, but uh, John Lindbergh, who uh, is president of the uh, Musicians Local uh, here that represents the symphony musicians. So, uh, and his right-hand man, Tom Reel is on there. So uh, any other uh, members uh, of um, organized labor that want to uh, give a shout out here to yourselves? Right here, Charlie, Helen Pryor. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I am your vice president of the Education Association of Norfolk. Very good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So with that, before we get to our uh, elected officials presentations, uh, I uh, thought, you know, I was going to prepare something pithy and something about Labor Day um, uh, and all that. And I said, why should I do that? Let me just go to the goddess of labor, uh, the force of uh, uh, labor politics uh, up at the General Assembly and nationally. Uh, and she was kind enough to uh, say yes. So uh, if you don't know, we have the uh, president of the Virginia AFL-CIO to bring us a, uh, a little Labor Day greeting, or should I say a greeting from labor. So thank you so much for joining us, Doris. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, let me just say hello to all of the labor people. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you've done. You know, uh, before, we started here this morning, you know, we've been talking, you know, about the pandemic and everything. And, you know, for the last year and a half, our lives have really just been turned upside down. Um, and despite everything, labor, you stepped up and you put yourself on the line. You protected each other. You fought for policies that would help our members and working people all across Virginia. And in doing all of that, you still elected pro-worker candidates, you bargained strong contracts, and you represented members through a really hard time. You know, the pandemic, I think, put a lot of things in high relief. Uh, and let's not pretend that at times our, or at least I know my belief in humanity and our democracy uh, wasn't a little bit shaken uh, with everything. But even though the, these were times when we saw the worst, we also saw the best in people. We saw communities coming together. And in the early months of COVID, we saw churches in Virginia that got together and volunteered to make masks for grocery store workers who put themselves well, on the line every day to make sure we got food and our families were fed. We held food drives, union members made masks, volunteered at testing and vaccination sites, locals stuck together to help the members through this time. And I think the country also learned something that, well, we've known forever 
Workers are heroes and we're essential to keeping each other safe and cared for, period. And when I look back, I'm stuck, I'm just struck by how what we push for year in and year out are the things that are needed now more than ever. Rights for workers, public services, paid sick days, voting laws that promote voter freedom, and Lord knows, health and safety protections and the actual enforcement of those safeguards. And I want to take this time on that to thank Congressman Bobby Scott for every single thing that you have done for health and safety and for protecting and pushing workers to have the right to organize in the PRO Act. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, solutions that people pointed to in the last year are things that the labor movement that we've pushed for for decades. The labor movement was and is on the front line of this crisis and it's gonna be the labor movement, it's gonna be who is gonna be pulling us out of it. Um, and then when I look back, you know, I'll have to shift gear now a little bit because it's also Labor Day, also means that kickoff to elections, right? You know, so let me just say for the past two years, Virginia has went, has moved so far. I mean, think about this. I was trying to jot down some of the things, you know, that we've accomplished in two years, but we got collective bargaining for local public employees. Now, it's a optional, which we got to change, but we also left state employees out. So we got to make sure that we get collective bargaining for state employees. We got $15 minimum wage increase, but we got to work to get farm workers included in that. Uh, we made improvements in workers' comp, but there's still things in workers' comp that we need to do. Um, and we have a secretary of labor. Can you believe that in Virginia? We have a secretary of labor. Now, Secretary Healy, she's been great. Uh, she's been a great advocate for us, but what's at stake in this election is when Terry McAuliffe becomes governor, okay? And we expand our numbers in the House of Delegates we're going to have a secretary of labor that's from labor. Uh, it is time that we do that. And that is something that we all need to work and strive for. So I really want to thank all of that, everybody for everything. And I'll just close by saying this. Uh, so a lot of the labor people uh, have heard me say this before. So it's not going to be a big surprise because actually probably if I didn't say it, uh, they would wonder how come I didn't. Um, but anyway, but this is the most important election ever for us here in Virginia. And I'm asked all the time, what is at stake here in Virginia? And this is the first time that I can actually answer that question with one word. And that's everything. Mm -hmm. Every single thing for workers and families across Virginia, Every single thing is at stake in this year's election. It took us 10 years to get to this point, and I don't know about you, but I am not going to lose it in this election because for years and years of work, we are making real progress on the protections of workers, raising wages, and indeed expanding workers' right to organize. And we're going to keep it up. And I know from here on out, everybody is going to be electing pro-worker candidates. So thank you because we're in this together and we're going to come out together and more unified than ever before. Thank you. Yay. Now, can you do that with passion? <laughs> Doris, as always, uh, uh, you bring a, a stem winder uh, of a speech. Uh, uh, thanks so much. If you want, uh, maybe a question or two, uh, if there are. Um, if not, we'll, uh, uh, we'll move on. But uh, again, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, 
Glenn Youngkin calls all this progress we've done uh, uh, Virginia in the ditch. So um, they just got a, a different view and just look at what's going on in Texas and other states. Um, everything is on the line. You're right. You're right. We don't want that uh, coming to Virginia. Um, anybody have something for Doris? Yes, Charlie. This is Tom. Yes. Just a reminder, it's in the chat. Um, at 1130 on Wednesday outside the World Trade Center in Norfolk, a uh, little rally, little march. Uh, that's that's where Senator Warner has his branch offices in the World Trade Center. We're still soliciting his support for the PRO Act, even though we're seeing ads on TV thanking him for being against it, which are very distressing to see. But we would really like to get a good turnout on this Wednesday, September 8th at 1130. The rallies are short, but they're fun. And uh, if you're in the union or you know, you don't have to be in the union. Right. In fact, this is in support of people who would like to be in a union. So please, uh, having great attendance at 1130 on September 8th at the World Trade Center would be just awesome. Thank you. All right. That's this Wednesday. If you can make it, it'd be great. You catering lunch, Tom? <laughs> um, no, no. The good, news, the good news is that I have nothing to do with food. <laughs> uh, okay anything else anybody it's not often you get uh one-on-one uh, -on -one with doris all right well and doris please stick around if you'd like but again thank you thank you so much for bringing uh, uh greetings from labor uh on this uh labor day weekend we're kind of old-fashioned we kind of think you should actually celebrate the reason for these holidays and uh, it's just not a day off. So, right. uh, but because of labor, it is a day off. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Thank uh, you. Okay. All right, moving on uh, to our uh, presentation. Let me see if anybody else jumped on real quick. Uh, yes, as I said, uh, uh, Delegate uh, uh, Angela Williams Graves did jump on. Diane Kaufman representing Tim Kaine's office has jumped on. And uh, bup, ba -da -da, bup, bup. and I think that's it. So if, again, uh, if I missed you, I'll, we'll get to you. All right, so of course, uh, first, um, um, uh, kind of a nice segue from the president of the AFL-CIO to the uh, uh, chair of uh, uh, education and labor. So uh, Congressman Scott. Well, thank you. And thank you, Doris, for, for your presentation, particularly about the importance of this election. As she pointed out, um, this is an important election because it will determine the direction we go in. As we all know, the Republicans are interested in mainly three things, taking away uh, minority voting rights, taking away everybody's health care, and giving tax cuts to the rich. That is their, what they get elected for, and that's what they do. Uh, they also want to um, they, get rid of the little gun safety um, uh, measures that we were able to pass. But if, if, um, if we expect to have a right to vote um, after this election, we have to win and make sure that Republicans are not in a position where they can take that right away. In Texas, the governor, uh, of a state that had a um, uh, electric system that totally collapsed the last uh, last uh, winter in the middle of one of the worst pandemics uh, in history, held special session after special session just to take away people's right to vote because that was his main priority. Uh, so we need to make the, our defense against that. That's what they do. Uh, you can't argue with them. That's how they're gonna vote. Um, and so the only defense against that is to make sure we vote and make sure they're not in a position to take away our right to vote. In uh, Washington, we're still celebrating the um, uh, Rescue Act where we uh, cut the child poverty rate in uh, half this year. And we're um, um, uh, making in, in, in substantial investments in uh, education, saved a million people's pensions on and on, uh, but we're also trying to build back better. The Senate passed a bipartisan roads and bridges uh, plan and the House is working on a um, build back better plan uh, that will not only do the physical infrastructure, but the human infrastructure. Our committee is working uh, on a lot of issues. Uh, regrettably, we were hoping to have $6 trillion to work with. It's only three and a half. 
And um, every time, every uh, time we turn around, they keep chipping away at what we have. We have, um, a, we're going to try to do um, child care and uh, universal pre-K, trying to make community college uh, tuition free. And um, there is a um, uh, right now a question of whether we're going to be able to do any meaningful uh, workforce development job training or use all that money for a um, uh, what they call the Civilian Climate Corps, um, which are untrained workers who work for a year and then uh, go back to whatever they were doing. Uh, we need, uh, there are millions of people um, who are um, um, in, um, in a situation where their unemployment uh, just ran out. If you're on the under the what they call the PU, PUA, uh, gig workers, un, um, independent contractors, self-employed, where you were were getting um, unemployment compensation, that's gone. The $300 plus up gone, and probably the um, uh, long-term unemployed in some states where you've been drawn unemployment more than 26 weeks, which is most people. Um, also gone. So you've got probably about five to seven million people um, who are now um, uh, in really tough shape. They'll need some job training to get back to work. Um, school construction, public school construction, uh, a public school in, um, in Maryland sent, sent everybody, sent all the students home because they didn't have air conditioning and it was too hot to be in school. Um, we also are gonna be trying to make permanent the child tax credit and the improvements we made in the Affordable Care Act uh, to make those permanent. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do. We don't know whether we're gonna be able to get it done. I mean, we have, uh, if we lose uh, four votes in the House or one vote in the Senate, we can't pass a bill because the Republicans are united against everything we're doing. Um, in, in, in committee, um, People want more than the arithmetic will allow and are uh, threatening to vote against the bill unless we expand eligibility, for example, in child care and community college more than the budget allocation we have will allow. Uh, so we'll just have to see how that works out. Uh, but we're working hard. We're going in the right direction. And hopefully we can get through um, our democratic uh, normal arguments and debates and end up with a, with a plan. Uh, if we can get anything passed, it will be transformational. Um, uh, but it, it's gonna be tough because there are some uh, fairly um, um, strongly held views on both sides. And if either side doesn't vote for it, um, like I said, we can, we can afford to lose three votes in the house, the fourth vote kills it. Um, that's not a lot to work with. Um, so we're doing the best we can. And uh, hopefully by this time uh, next month, we'll have a great product and um, uh, still on the way to victory. But if we don't do anything, I think we have a lot to celebrate in the rescue plan. Uh, cutting child poverty in half is something to celebrate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you almost make it sound like uh, governing in a uh, bicameral legislator is difficult. Uh, yeah. e either either camera roll is difficult. <laughs> All right. Uh, questions for the congressman. No. Wow. So the presentation was uh, uh, so good. Uh, uh, nobody's quite there. We go, Mariana. I'm wondering about the Social Security. Um, do you think we can raise taxes on the rich so we can shore up Social Security? That people are counting on that. You know, so many times when I've been canvassing, the older people I see, they're counting on that, and I'm not too far from it either. So, well, I'm on, I've been on Social Security. It's a nice check you get every month. Um, that is, uh, Social Security is not on the agenda for this for this round. Um, uh, there are a number of uh, Social Security proposals pending, um, but uh, nothing in Social Security, good or bad, is uh, being considered um, in this uh, in this package. 
uh, so far. I mean, you know, anything could pop up. I saw yeah, I did. Yeah. in 2034, um, we could run out of money for Social Security. So I hope y'all will well, put well, that on the well, agenda. That, 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 um, that is an interesting number. When they talk about running out of money, that is actually uh, not true. Right. Uh, there will be enough money coming in uh, in 2034, uh, even though we not, we're, won't be able to pay the promised inflation uh, increased benefits that are promised will be able to pay at least 75% of the promised benefits. And I saw one calculation that showed that that is on a, we're on, that's on wage inf inflation. On a regular inflation basis, we're still pretty much paying the present benefits. So it's, uh, it's not like we fall off a cliff and get nothing. Um, uh, we fall off a cliff and get, um, uh, get saved about three quarters of the way down. Um, that's in 2034. That's uh, uh, about 13 years from now. We have plenty of years to make little minor adjustments that can uh, keep us whole. Um, uh, we have never had much more than 10 or 20 years um, um, before we go, quote, bankrupt, uh, not be able to pay the whole promised benefits. Medicare is never is, is worse is worse than that. Um, but we've always uh, before we got there made uh, the little adjustments. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I, I'm not af afraid of the uh, 2034 um, as a time when there will be no Social Security uh, benefits. And it, it doesn't take much of an increase. I mean, if we uh, remove the cap, which is what uh, most people want to do, we would have too much money. We could pay. We could increase benefits, uh, which is what I'd like. To, which would, which is what I'd like to see. Just uh, remove the cap, increase benefits. I mean, people keep talking about you got to cut benefits to um, uh, to to meet the revenue. What's wrong with increasing benefits? I mean, is something. Uh, I mean, is if people got got something against senior citizens having a slightly better retirement? Yeah. Um, so I mean the the, the solutions, uh, the earlier you do them, the cheaper they are. Um, but they they're not they're not part of this uh, this package. Okay, great. Um, before I get to Carrie, I did see our uh, wonderful treasurer Don Hester has jumped on. But uh, uh, Carrie, you got a question? Yeah, I, I really just wanted to piggy, piggyback on Mariana's comment and say that it's really, I mean, for me, the, it's, it's part of my planning for retirement is and how much money that is coming in. And I really think, you know, a lot of us are older on this. So either we're rapidly approaching or, or will be within the next 10 years is being eligible for these things. And it's it's incredibly important to us in planning how much money we're going to be getting. So, I, you know, and, and that's part of what it is, is I do believe that there are scare tactics and I appreciate your comments, um, Congressman Scott. I really do. I just really hope that this gets settled on before we get too much further down the line. Uh, there's another, the projections um, are, are projections. There's a range and there are a lot of little things we can do like uh, if we improved uh, immigration and had more workers, uh, that would improve the social security situation. There are a lot of little things that we can, uh, we can do. The easiest is just to flat out Remove the cap on um, on taxes. That um, that solves the problem. That more than solves the problem overnight. Uh, there's a lot of there's growing support for that. It only affect. It has no effect on people making less than a hundred thousand dollars a year. It would, um, of course, violate um, um, the president's promise not to increase taxes on those making um, less than four hundred thousand dollars a year. Where he came up with that number, I don't know. Um, but um, that would be 
somewhat awkward with that. So there may be a little donut hole. You um, you you skip from a hundred and right. little hundred and some, and then start removing the cap of those over four hundred thousand. Uh, oh. um, sorry, I just realized there was one other thing which had to do with four hundred one k plans. Um, there are within certain rules of 401k plans, the companies are evaluated on a discrimination basis. And it's really the employees these who are getting discriminated against, hence, um, where if they've contributed at the max amount of contribution, but the company is deemed not to have enough uh, people either contributing or the fact is, is there's a high number of employees with high salary levels. Um, we're getting penalized by not being able to put away the money into a 401k and getting that money sent back to us. Is there any discussion on that? I think, uh... I'm, I'm not sure um, the discrimination is that you can't have a plan much more generous to the uppity ups than the average worker. Um, so um, I'm not sure exactly how th there's a limit to how much you can put in. And um, in terms of matching what the company matches, they can't match for the um, executives more than they match, less than they match for the for the workers. There's a tendency in these, if they've given a free hand to um, um, be much more generous to the executives than the workers. Um, but I, I, I think the um, idea is to make sure that the workers get as good a deal on these things as everybody else. Okay, for now, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Congressman Scott. So this is really more of a comment to what you said about raising uh, Social Security. So having um, working both on the urban side and the rural side, here's one of the things that people talk to me about a lot. And I absolutely understand it because I have family members who've experienced it, too. And that is when you come from a rural community, uh, many of the folks have been farm workers, uh, they have been domestic workers. Uh, they have done very, very low wage jobs. So they get the, the, the smallest amount of social security. And so for them, when they have retired, then it becomes a real issue between choosing medicine, prescription medicine, choosing whether or not you're gonna get to go out for a dinner. There's so many things that they don't get to experience because their social security just isn't enough. So when I think about plans that we put in place to raise children out of poverty, which is really important, I would just like to acknowledge that there are a bunch of our seniors who live in poverty too, and who really, really struggle to make ends meet. And thinking about how do we look at plans to help them live a much better life and have a retirement that's with a lot more dignity that many of them have today. The um, social security uh, plan um, pays, the, the formula is much more generous to those on the low end. They get a, they get higher benefits for every dollar they put in than those at the top. Um, so that um, reality that you want to help those at the bottom is part of the formula. Uh, but the more you pay in, the higher benefit you get. Um, but the, um, like I said, the it's it's um, a better deal for those at the bottom. Most of the improvements. Um, changes with Social Security um, uh, exacerbate that um, um, minimum benefit, so it would even be a better a better deal for those at the bottom. So that what you the problem you have uh, suggested is on the minds of those at least a lot of us when we uh, fashion the Social Security formula. We want to make sure it is a better deal for those on the bottom than those on the top. Yeah, and then my other question then would be, especially when you have two folks on Social Security and then one of them passes away, 
And so you've been living with the two incomes and now the, the spouse passes. And I think it works as if whatever the higher one is, is the one that you get. And there might be some basis to that. But when I have conversations with folks, this is the, especially seniors, this is the one thing that always comes up and they always are very, very um, challenged, it seems. And especially if you have healthcare issues. I, I'm not married, so I'm not, I haven't done those forms, but, um, and somebody can help me out on this. I, th I think there's an option where you can choose um, the survivor benefits where both survivors, the survivor's benefits go and continue for the survivor, or you can have a higher benefit, but when one passes, their benefits go down. Um, can, is anybody familiar with that? And, and so if you chose the higher benefits, but the benefits go down when one passes, then that was a choice that you made. I think that's right. Does anybody know? Anybody on the, any, we have any yeah. social security experts on, 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 yeah. on, on, the, on the call? Yeah. Congressman Scott, this is Delegate Williams Graves. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but I do recall, <clears throat> excuse me, when my father passed away, both my mom and my dad were on Social Security. So for example, if my mother was making $500 a month and my dad was making $700 a month, that was a combined $1,200 a month income. What happened was my mother then got my father $700 a month, but she didn't get $1,200 a month. And I think that's what Fanal is, um, is explaining or, or the question uh, that she's asking is that it, and if, and if social security is able to award the entire $1,200 a month, nobody over there is telling people that they can do that. So if they don't already know it, the automatic go-to says, oh yeah, Miss whoever or Mr. Whoever, you now get the $700 the month that your husband was getting and they go oh great but now you lose the five hundred dollars so you then go from a twelve hundred dollar a month income to now a seven hundred dollar a month income right. and that still creates a problem instead of the spouse inheriting the entire seven hundred dollars that they that so that household is not left at a disadvantage. And I think that's what she's e explaining, but it was never, okay. It was never explained to us that she, if there is an option that was never explained to my mom when, when my father passed away. And so she got the higher amount, but it didn't, she didn't keep the whole household mm -hmm. amount. It is exactly right. Yeah. All right. All right. Um... And of course, uh, uh, for all those, uh, I apologize, but uh, I have to say for the most important question, <laughs> Diane Kaufman. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Scott, not a question, just have to say it's Labor Day weekend, sadly, second year in a row, one of the premier political events of the year, one of the highlights of my year is <laughs> your Labor Day picnic and we won't be there. Uh, we, we, we miss it. Um, it's sad, but just want to acknowledge what a, a wonderful uh, event you hold year after year. You and Team Scott headed up by Miss Joni Ivy and Team Scott. So uh, we're sad. We understand, but hopefully. And you muted yourself. Yeah, what happened? Thank you for everything yeah. you do. In particular, your lovely Labor Day event. Right. Thanks all. Well, thank you. We'll, tr we'll try again next year. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, good questions. Uh, I guess uh, we'll never be able to solve uh, Social Security on a monthly breakfast call, but uh, <laughs> those are uh, uh, important public policy uh, issues to discuss uh, going forward. Uh, moving on to the uh, General Assembly. I'm going to uh, uh, defer to uh, uh, ladies first over seniority. So with that said, uh, um, Angela, how are you doing? 
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am doing well. Happy Labor Day weekend to everyone. And thank you, uh, Charlie, for having me uh, on the call or on our Zoom. Um, I just want to, I don't have a whole lot. I just want to say uh, happy Labor Day weekend and thank everyone who um, is involved in labor and who has paved the way for us to get um, to this point where we are. We have done a lot of great things in the General Assembly in the, in, at least in the last year that I was there and in the last few years that Democrats have maintained a majority. I will tell you personally, as a woman, um, and, and, and and as a woman who believes she has a sound mind, the, the, the rulings coming out of Texas with regard to women's rights scare me to death. And um, anytime we have government for, for, for a party that says that they want less government interaction, less government in our personal business, less government, less government, less government, it seems as though um, that party is just taking government interaction uh, to the extreme. And so I totally agree with Doris. Everything is on the line um, in this this election and we need to do everything that we can in order to make sure that people know um, that they know number one, that they can vote. They know number two, where to vote. Um, they know about early voting. Early voting is new to us in Virginia. This is really only the second time, um, the, the second election cycle that we've had early voting. And so um, early voting in Norfolk begins on September 17th and it is available um, at City Hall. You can go to City Hall you don't even have to get out of your vehicle. Someone will come down to you, um, fill out your ballot. You have the ability to absentee ballot without an excuse, without an excuse. So you can you can request your absentee ballot um, and, and vote um, without an excuse. And then come, I believe it's October 13th. Um, we will have uh, four satellite locations in Norfolk that will have early voting. And one is the Jordan Newby Library. The other is the Berkeley Recreation Center. The third is the Lambert's Point Community Center. And the fourth one is the Pretlow Library. And so um, I, we just want to make sure that everybody knows that that they can vote early, that they can absentee ballot vote without an excuse, without needing a, an excuse to do so. Um, so nobody has to lie. They can just tell the truth. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and then the other piece is that we have Sunday voting, which I am so excited about. Um, I led the charge in Norfolk. I was the chief co-patron of that bill in the General Assembly um, to allow Sunday voting and led the charge in Norfolk to get Sunday voting. So we have two um, Sundays, the third and fourth Sunday, um, the third and fourth Sundays for uh, Sunday voting. And I believe that's October the 17th and the 24th um, for right. Sunday voting from 12 to, from 11 to four, oh, from 11, 11 to four. Right. So you can go get your Jesus in, Buddha, Allah, whoever it is that you worship on Sunday. And then you can go and get your vote on and, um, and then go on about your merry way. So uh, that's all I really have. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that um, you know, I agree with Doris. This is this is very, very, very important. It's important for workers, but it is critical for women. It is absolutely critical for women. There is a passage that says that we were not we were not made with the spirit of fear, but in love and in, and with a sound mind. And I believe in the sound mind that God gave me. And I don't believe that anybody else should have the right to make decisions about me, my body, my future, or anything else um, with regard to my health um, and my body. 
um, in, in government. And so if we want to keep women's rights um, moving forward and not take them back to the dark stone ages, then we definitely need to make sure that we get out and that we vote in this upcoming election. So that's all that I have. Thank you, Charlie. And yeah. I will take any questions if anybody well, has any. How about, how about if we get uh, Jay on here and then we can uh, uh, get questions for the both of you uh, as we goes. And then see if Norfolk, uh, I'm hoping we have uh, one robust Souls of the Poles uh, effort uh, here in Norfolk. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, Delegate Jones, good morning. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you. I wish we were in person and amazing soul food, but we are back to doing things as safely as possible. Uh, I want to echo what Bobby and what Angela said about uh, our respect and our uh, reverence for labor. As the grandson of a teacher, I know how hard everybody works and that everybody uh, who is a part of the labor movement is the backbone of society. It's why we were able to move through this pandemic, uh, that our lights were still on, that things were still going uh, day in and day out with the folks working their butts off at the port. Uh, I was so proud to uh, carry a bill in the General Assembly to get workers' compensation for um, our first responders, firefighters, EMS, uh, police, jail officers, um, to make sure that they got uh, their fair share for putting their lives on the line. And um, Doris, thank you for all that you do. I'm so proud to have the support of the AFL-CIO, the firefighters, and all the rest of those labor organizations that we've been working with for very for a long time now um, to get these things done. And Doris mentioned all of the gains that we've made. When I got elected four years ago, those things were unthinkable, getting to $15 on the minimum wage, getting collective bargaining in any fashion, uh, making sure that we had workplace protections for um, workers. That was that stuff was was so sort of sort of foreign to, to everybody in the General Assembly. But because of our hard work, we've been able to do that and make those changes. But I think all of those things are on the line in this election. Uh, don't ever listen to any poll that you see. We run like we are down by 10 points, uh, that we have ground to make up. And so that's why I and so many others have been working so hard, not only to turn out people in Norfolk, but across the state because I don't want to go back to the minority. You guys know me, I'm a little bit cranky sometimes. I will be even crankier if I have to go back to the minority. And so I'm going to do everything that I can to make sure that we don't do that. So that's why I'm knocking doors this weekend. I hope you guys will do that too. And as I've said every year, uh, the path to statewide victories for Democrats runs right through this city. And we know the burden that is on our shoulders. And if we don't step up and we don't get our friends and family members and neighbors uh, out to vote, then it's going to be a tough four years, tough couple of years. Uh, and I don't want that. And I know you guys don't want that either. Uh, and so we got a lot of work ahead of us. And so with that, I would just say, uh, everybody, it's time for us to get to work. We got two months um, and, and we've all got, got work to do. So uh, the last thing I'll say before we can take questions is hopefully you guys have seen, um, I have my annual event, Brews and Barbecue. I'm trying to get uh, on the sort of longevity that Congressman Scott has with his annual Labor Day event. We are, I think, on year four now um, with one interruption uh, for COVID. But if you guys would join us on the 23rd at Maker's Craft Brewery at six o'clock, we'd love to see you guys there. Um, I'll drop a link when we're done. But thanks for all that you guys do. Thanks for giving up your Saturday. Um, and hopefully we'll see you guys in person sometime soon. All right, any General Assembly questions? Miss Mariana. Um, well, I put it in the chat. I'm just very concerned, and I know a lot of the teachers are very concerned, especially about the kids under 12. We're about to go back to school. Um, some schools have already gone back in person, and you know they've already had to shut down in various places. Um, I want us to be proactive. Um, I've written the governor. I've asked other people to write the governor to reconvene the General Assembly. Uh, because I just felt that I was so, so, I felt so, um, I just so happy that we had Governor Northam um, and he protected us from the devastation of COVID rather than one of these other crazy governors who won't even do basics. Um, but the, the masking and uh, is not going to be enough for kids who are in school for, you know, seven, eight hours a day, um, social distancing, which we've now moved from six feet to three feet, is not going to be able to happen everywhere. Um, we don't have class, uh, we don't have windows in my classroom. Um, when people go to lunch, I know at my school, they're talking about seniors being able to go outside to eat. 
Um, I've heard of schools where, um, you know, they, they sit by table and everybody at lunch is, has an assigned seat so they know where they're sitting for contact tracing purposes. And uh, one table after another ends up getting quarantined. So I just want us to be proactive. I want us to um, think about, um, are there some adjustments that we can make like only sending in half of the kids at a time so that we really are able to social distance better. Um, so I'm actually asking that um, the governor consider postponing school a week and bringing the General Assembly back um, to discuss options. Um, I know it's late, but we evacuate people at the last minute uh, when there's a hurricane. We're gonna be sending, um, uh, nationally we're sending 48 million kids back to school. Um, even at very low percentages, like 2% of the kids who get COVID are hospitalized. When you're talking about 48 million kids, that's a lot. So I'm um, just putting that out there. Um, well, Mary, and let, let, me, let me say this to you, and, and you have expressed your concerns to me offline, and I appreciate that. Um, and I was out of town this week, but I definitely did see your message. So I voted against the bill that we passed in the General Assembly earlier this year. And my issue with the bill was not that we wanted to get kids back in school because I'm, I'm all about that, but that it chained us to the CDC guidance, which to me is a little bit problematic because if we're having issues here in Virginia, but there are issues, there are not issues elsewhere, the CDC isn't going to make a one-off recommendation for us. And that to me was a little bit sort of strong in, in a way for us to do that. And you see that we're having a little bit of these issues with Delta. Now, uh, that's the way that we've got to go for the moment. Uh, but I certainly think that um, if something happens, if we see these numbers spike to levels that we saw um, back in March of 2020, the governor will, will do something. Um, but I know that they're looking at the data every single day uh, to make sure that we, we are sort of keeping ourselves in line. I will say this, and you know this, and I say this to my colleagues who are from, I'd say the suburbs or more wealthy parts of Virginia, they have schools where they can distance their children because they're new, they're big, they've got plenty of room. In Norfolk, uh, the cafeteria, the auditorium and the gymnasium are all one room. So we can't sort of have these students overflowing into those different facilities. And that's one of our challenges. And so in the General Assembly, uh, I have sort of tried to make the case for um, school construction and school rehabilitation uh, with all of this in mind, because it seems like our colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle and our uh, brothers and sisters who might not agree with us politically don't want to do the things that we have to do to make this go away and that we end up living with this for a long time and as opposed to a pandemic, it's an endemic. And so if we're going to have to keep doing this stuff, we've got to think sort of for, on, over the medium and long term about how we are um, approaching these issues, but I think Norfolk in particular is one of those urban areas that struggles because our facilities are so old. What you're describing, Jay, is a gymnatoria. It's yeah, a gym, the, an auditorium, yeah, right, and a right, cafeteria, cafeteria all right, in, exactly. but yeah, it's a gymnatoria, exactly. and it's something that we, um, when I was on council, we struggled with with the new schools. It was a combination of space to build, and it was also, which we have that some of the other, like you said, in localities that have schools that have lots and lots of land to build on, they can do all these different spaces as well as, um, you know, like usage of those individual spaces. Um, throughout the school year and beyond. And I totally agree. I think to the other um, catch 22 on um, school with children and these um, schedules that may be one off, three days on, three days off, two days on, two days off, that also wreaks havoc on parents' schedules when they have to go to work. And so now that we don't have the um, rent moratorium, that has been reversed. We don't have, you know, a lot of utility companies are, you know, they're reaching out to people to try to work with them on past due balances, but shutoffs can you know, can happen. So when we start thinking about, and I, and I get the total safety of children and making sure that they are safe, that teachers are safe, but there's so many different um, 
pieces to this puzzle in terms of making this um, work smoothly for everyone. It's really a conundrum and it's unfortunate that our friends on the other side of the aisle won't just wear the doggone mask and take the shot in the arm that they ranted and raved about so much at the beginning of the session. Jay, you remember we heard lecture after lecture about having the availability of shots in arms. And now that they are readily available, um, so many of them won't, won't get vaccinated and don't want to wear a mask. And so it does create a problem for all of us when we can't get on the same page for something as basic as every human being being healthy and every human being staying alive and all of our children being healthy and all of our children staying alive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I do realize it's a very complex it, issue it is. and very. the isolation has also been a very compli complex issue. We're losing people because of the isolation that we've had as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just would like to have the flexibility um, because I feel that we're just walking into a maelstrom. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing the kids. <laughs> you know, we, we want the kids back in school, uh, but we just want to make sure it's safe. Absolutely. And if I could add something to that that's just really important that sometimes we seem to miss is that although we're masking our children and we're socially distancing them, um, especially middle school and high school where they can get their vaccinations, I'm in an elementary school and these over year months have socially and emotionally traumatized our children. So even when you put their masks on and you label their seats, being children, being the loving children that they are, they continue to break protocol. They take off their masks, they hug each other, and it's all under good pretenses. You know, they want to share. They want to share their food. They want to share their drink. They want to share their tables. So taking them back to school and spreading them apart like we did. When did we come back, Mariana? April, May, and June? To watch my children walk into the classroom and not be able to touch or talk. Many of them have asthma, other issues, the masks are hurting them. With our special needs children, our speech therapy, they can't understand us through the masks. So there's all these additional factors that have to be taken into place because as teachers, it is breaking our hearts to watch this. It truly is. And maybe, maybe it is time to stay home a little bit longer to get it right because we can't keep doing this to them. Think about some of them are five, six, seven years old and they're angry and they're hurt. So I just wanted to put that piece out there because their social and emotional development to me comes first before their academic. Thank you. Yeah. Camille, you Good got that. Hawkins, I would like to try, add something try. as well. Um, I feel that the divisions should have more flexibility. We do want the students back. But it's very sad that in our efforts to meet the law of Senate Bill 1303, um, that we were mandated to start school in person no matter what. I think there should have been provisions in that law that allowed flexibility for local districts to still look at the metrics of this virus now in a mutated form so that division leaders and superintendents would feel more comfortable making decisions that will be based on health and safety of this public health crisis and managing it. Because what's gonna happen, we are gonna shut back down. We already see the, the trajectory of this. So for us to sit there and not have a plan B, we have Chrome devices, but we have not been focusing as, as a Commonwealth on, okay, this is the plan B. We have not been doing that. I'm saying that, as one of many divisions that we have, we have contingency, but we haven't really been focusing on, let's have that plan be ready when it has to go into effect. So I think that, um, I know our state union has gone on the record to um, go back to the General Assembly, ask them to have a special session that will allow more language in the law to give us
schools need that, the staff members need that, our students and families need that as we continue mm. to increase our, our herd immunity with vaccinations in our, in our I can't hear him as well. Yeah, Phil, you, we lost we lost your volume right there at the end, but I think we got uh, um, uh, your point. Um, all right, with that, we have uh, started up because uh, hand, hands Charlie, are gone. Charlie, we have time for, one, Jay, for one more. Yeah. I was going to say, we, have, we would probably have time for one more question because I know we got to move yeah. on to some other people. Right. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, uh, so we need to make these real quick because uh, we got to move on. Uh, Camille. <clears throat> I just wanted to make a point even with even if they go back to school there's been no thought about children that are high risk like cancer survivors those parents should have a choice about having uh zoom or whatever if that's their choice uh i y'all are talking about general plans and and solving everybody's problems but parents should have some choice thank you yeah all right, uh, Ruth, you got something real quick? You lost your Ruth. All right, Carrie? Um, yes, the, uh, actually this is a combined question for both uh, Ramin and the delegates. So we recently had the trial of our former sheriff, Bob McCabe and I'm just wondering, you know, it was a federal trial. It wasn't done by the state or any of the Commonwealth's attorneys. And I understand that, that our Commonwealth attorney would be too close to this, but I wanna know why was it a federal trial? Why is the ethics laws within the state so lax that there was nothing that he did wrong on the state level or you know, how does that all work? So I'll start and I'll say that, and I'm sure you watched it just like everybody else. Um, and Ramin can talk about why it's federal versus state, but I will say that what they charged him with was I think like mail fraud, wire fraud. And so those are, those are federal crimes. But um, I think your, your point is that we have a, a very lax system of ethics and campaign finance. And that has been a problem for a long, long time. And we actually have a commission that is meeting uh, our colleague, Delegate Marcus Simon, is, is, sits on it. Uh, Don Scott from Portsmouth is on it. Lamont Bagby from Henrico is on it um, to address the sort of deficiencies in our campaign finance system. You know, we had the ethics overhaul, I think, 10 years ago in the wake of the Bob McDonald um, scandal. And so now Angela and I and our colleagues are required to file gift reports. We've got to disclose um, where all of our money comes from. We've got to do it on a timely basis. It's come to my attention that the penalties for not filing your reports are probably not as strict as they should be. Um, I've had several people come to me with that in the last month or two. And so that's something that I'll look at as we go into the next General Assembly session. But um, when it comes to the sort of prosecution stuff, um, Ramin can handle that. But I think we all agree that we need some tighter standards on campaign finance, on our ethics, um, to make sure that we're disclosing all of the conflicts that exist. Uh, and, and, and you know, I think that will restore some more trust in the public, in uh, us as public officials. And I, so I, it is now 10 o'clock. I do have to jump, yeah, um, but okay. I do want to say thanks, guys. It's, it, it, I appreciate your questions. I appreciate your passion. You guys know how to get to me if you need me. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully I'll see you guys out on the doors this weekend. Um, but now I'll see you on Monday. Looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, Jay. Guys. And I'll just jump in and say, um, I do recall when we did um, a campaign finance overhaul, and it was about 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I believe, I believe personally, and maybe I'm naive, but I believe personally that the vast majority of elected officials follow the rules, or at least they attempt to follow the rules. They are following them to either the best of their knowledge or to the best of their interpretation. And it to me, it's just like anything else in a manner of speaking that if somebody wants to break the rules, if somebody wants to skirt the rules, if somebody's looking for a way to get around the rules, they're going to do that. And that's when the federal government, you know, steps in. Our campaign finance reform system or, or a state board of elections, or whatever, they are very short staffed. And a lot of times they are reactionary and not 
they're what do you call it reacting and not proactive in certain things but like jay said we do have a commission to do it but i generally believe that the majority of people who are elected officials are doing the right thing or at least making every effort to do the right thing and none of us I could, I think I can honestly say in a blanket statement, want to go to jail for a couple of hundred dollars. Right. Um, and so I'll leave the federal part of it to Ramin because he's the legal eagle. I'll, I say ditto to everything that you've already heard. I can give you the real nuts and bolts answer. Uh, part of it is bandwidth. Part of it is the differences between federal and state law. I'll preface this by saying that, that in our office, historically, if we've seen public corruption, we've done our best to deal with it. Uh, I personally was involved in prosecuting the chef who blew the whistle on Governor McDonald. Uh, we handled the chef's prosecution on the state side. Uh, we were actually privy to a lot of the information that came out later, the Ferrari, the check, and uh, we had to thread a very careful needle there because we knew that an indictment of a sitting governor was on the way. Uh, I also worked on the, the no-show worker case. I'm sure you all remember that, but it, it was all over the newspaper. So when the case is suitable for being prosecuted in, in the state system, I've done everything. I actually happen to be a white collar crime specialist. Like, I'm happy to do it. I enjoy doing it because it actually holds privileged people accountable. Yeah. Um, the Generally speaking and specifically speaking, it was the correct thing for the federals to handle both the sheriffs and to go back in history, the treasurers, Anthony Burfitt's prosecutions. Uh, part of it is a resource issue, part of it is, is a substantive law issue. The substantive law issue is this. When you're putting together a public corruption case or a huge RICO case with a bunch of gangsters, you need a lot of witnesses, some of whom could be scattered all over the country, documents from all over the place, and you need to be able to lock those people into their stories under oath. The federal grand jury system, where you can call witnesses in secret, gather documents, gather witness testimony, uh, is totally different from the Virginia state system. And on a, a list of about 10 things that I'm going to try and advocate for during my time as Commonwealth's attorney, I'm going to be working on a grand jury reform that will allow us to call witnesses like that routinely. Our grand jury doesn't work like that. Our so-called special grand juries do. They're very rare. I'm going to use them in my administration, uh, but I need the judge's permission to do that. Okay. The, um, the other piece of it is, again, a resource piece. Uh, for example, in, in Sheriff McCabe's trial, there were witnesses and documents in Nashville. There were, there were other witnesses who had retired and moved away. Now, being able to reach out and touch those people is something that the federal government has a lot more resources to do. Uh, I had a case, and I, I don't know if I mentioned that I'm a former federal prosecutor also, so I've seen the inside of this. Now, I had to touch a, a, a witness in a child pornography case in rural Michigan when I was working in Charlottesville. I put out a request, and eight hours later, the FBI found that person and talked to that person. That's just simply not something that we can do on our end. Uh, we, yeah. we, have, we are dealing with a lot of other things. So now, if the federals had declined, and finally, with, with Sheriff McCabe's case, that was a federal initiated investigation. So they never even gave us a chance at it. Even if we had wanted it, they had the investigation. Now, if the feds had declined it and brought it to us, I would have prosecuted it happily. But, but I'm glad the feds did it because that's what their specialty is. And they got the right result. Thanks. All right. Uh, Ruth, I don't know if your question was to the uh, General Assembly folks uh, or, or not, Ruth, but uh, we got some folks we got to get to. Oh, you're on, you're, you're on route, mute there, Ruth. Charlie? Yes. It really had to do with um, the benefit of the children. It, it's back with the schools. Yeah. And I'm thinking that if the, ch I agree with Mariana 100%. But if we close down the schools, I think that uh, the grammar schools particularly need to take a look at a revised curriculum okay. so that when these kids get into high school, they will be ready to tackle those courses. So they won't get out of high school at a tremendous disadvantage. disadvantage. Okay. All right. 
And I yeah, think uh, yeah cool. this, the whole the whole schools and COVID thing is is terrible. Yeah, I know. And uh, uh, yeah, so folks are working good. on it. Yeah, but I appreciate your uh, passion. Um, you. let's, hey, Charlie, uh, can I jump in one thing, please? Yeah, sure. I just want to remind everybody who is concerned about the schools and concerned about the curriculum and concerned about we have a school board that is elected. And while you are writing the governor and telling the governor what you would like to see in the schools, your local school board members would love to hear from you so that you can let them know what your thoughts are and you can let them know what your wishes are because they're the ones that are crafting some of this curriculum and crafting some of these models in order to be able to educate our children. And they also are petitioning the governor based on, you know, the things that they're coming up with. So I want to remind everyone that the local school board in Norfolk um, is elected. Look up who your local elected school board member is and reach out to them and pay attention to those school board meetings as well. Absolutely. All right. Uh, moving on to uh, uh, city issues. Uh, Don, thanks for uh, hanging in there with us. Uh, anything you want to bring us from the treasurer's office? Hey, I'm coming. There you go. We got you. Hello. Yep, you're on. Hello. You were on. She's muted. She's muted. That's there you go. Hello. There you go. Hey, I don't know what I'm doing, but anyway, I can't let you see me. Um, <laughs> but hi, everyone. And also, um, I hope that we all have a safe holiday weekend. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I just want everyone to know that the treasurer's office is open Monday through Friday. Um, you can walk in at any time. We're open from 8.30 to 3.45. Um, we will continue to operate um, still with a limited staff, but we are open to serve you. And um, I think because we've had so much conversation, I'll stop it right there. Unless there are some questions for me, real estate um, bills were dropped on August 30th and they're due um, September 5th. Any questions for me, anyone? Well, we're glad you're back uh, uh, opposite the uh, commissioner's office. Good to see you guys back. Uh, on our side. Yeah, in the old day. Yeah. Don, you just said that you dropped the real estate bills on August 30th, and the bill is due September 5th. 30, I'm 30th, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that was wrong. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, thanks. Thanks again, uh, Dawn. We appreciate uh, all your good work. Uh, um, now we have our uh, first time uh, candidate, uh, uh, Blythe Scott uh, from the Commissioner of Revenue's office. Our uh, current commissioner, I know how much she wants to uh, continue in that, uh, that gig. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Happy uh, Labor Day weekend to all of our labor. Thank you so much for all you do. Um, just real briefly, my campaign's going. I have yard signs. I'm going to drop in the chat some ways to contact me. Things are going well. The Commissioner of Revenue's office is open as well. Um, we need to get all of the Dems elected. So please, everybody step up, grab your neighbor, grab your friends, even the ones who say they don't know what's going on. Just get them, get them involved. Um, we, need, we need help getting all of our Dems elected uh, November 2nd. I'm super excited to be your commissioner. Love seeing you all. Our office is also open. We do ours by appointment, but when you're, if you happen to come in to see the treasurer, you just come right across. And typically we have some availability right away. So please, we're open every day. If there's something you need, reach out. I'm gonna put our office information in there and please vote for this Blythe Scott uh, on the ballot this year. All right, thanks so much, everybody. By the way, that is a fantastic looking uh, logo you have there. It is. <laughs>
Uh, yeah. Hey, come on. A uh, uh, B Scott for Norfolk. What can go? Uh, nothing can go wrong with that, right? Uh, B Scott of Nooper News. So, all right. Thanks, Blythe. And uh, yeah, let us know. Uh, give us an email. Uh, whatever you want. Uh, we, we, we are, as far as yard signs go, I know we have some coordinated campaign signs that are coming in soon. So we'll try and uh, uh, have a yard sign blitz and get uh, uh, the McAuliffe signs, Blythe signs, whoever else is signs need to get out there. Because uh, I do see uh, uh, some of the other folks out there. They got a head start on us. But uh, all right. Uh, anything uh, further um, you want to do? Um, uh, uh, ask uh, Raman or, or say besides uh, what you've already said. I'll I'll keep it brief. Just thank you everybody for for your support again. The we uh, I'm glad not to have an opponent in November. I'm going to be helping all of our other candidates up and down the ballot. Um, the I'll I'll say if anybody's seen CB4, the way Chris Rock's uh, uh, beer gets bigger as the movie goes on, my glass of tea in the morning keeps getting bigger. But I'm very appreciative of everybody's support, and I look forward to serving you. Good, um, and we appreciate it. All right, let's uh, get some uh, announcements in. I know uh, there are uh, uh, some folks who want to uh, bring those to our attention. <laughs> Um, hey, Charlie, I just want to let you know that oh, I'm you're on. on. I didn't see you get on, Joe. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I'm, I'm uh, down here at an event for Joy and Roshan for their baby shower in, uh, in Antigua. And so we're enjoying our Labor Day weekend uh, because we all know that right after Labor Day weekend is when we are all really hitting the ground running for our campaigns. And uh and I'm sorry to interrupt. If it's not my turn, I'll, I'll wait. No, no, no. I, I, can say, I apologize. I didn't see you uh, get on the call. So uh, well, uh, let her go. So just a quick announcement. Uh, our, our very first year for Camp Hope was an extreme success. We had 20 children uh, who come from violent backgrounds or uh, Trump traumatic backgrounds uh, that participated. Uh, some of the children were fearful of uh, going to the camps, but once they got there uh, and working with our deputies and our counselors, all I can say is they didn't want to leave. They enjoyed it so much. Uh, and we're going to continue that program with uh, monthly mentoring uh, for those youth. Uh, they really opened up in the group sessions. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a curriculum based uh, program, uh, but we're so excited about its success. Um, you know, we had, uh, Unfortunately, we had one child that got a fever, so we, we had to take uh, that child home, and she was crying, not because um, she wasn't feeling well, but she was crying because she didn't want to leave the camp, but we assured her she would be available to go to next year's camp, and, uh, and she would participate in the mentoring programs every month. Uh, it's a big deal. Made, made our hearts, uh, my staff and myself and everybody else involved or, you know, really warmed our hearts, uh, gave me some goosebumps. Anyways, it's a success story. It's one of the things that we should be doing uh, as a sheriff's office. Uh, we're the only sheriff's office in the country, by the way, that runs a Camp Pope. Uh, other Camp Popes are run by uh, agencies or, or whatever groups like YMCA's and that kind of thing. Uh, but Virginia didn't have one. And so we brought it to you and it's a, a partnership with the Family Justice Center. Uh, that we also, since our last meeting, we had several people uh, graduating with their GEDs. Uh, as I said before, uh, we've expanded our GED programs. We have a partnership, uh, you know, with uh, Calvary and the House of Esther, um, with bringing GED training virtually, uh, and which is a fantastic partnership. It's partnerships in the community uh, that are helping br us bring the very best programs that we can bring. Uh, to the 851 inmates that we have in our care uh, to make a difference in their lives and then eventually, hopefully, uh, give them the tools they need not to return uh, to the jail and, and find that there's a, a better life for them out there than uh, what they're currently doing. Uh, and it's, it is working. We are having an impact. Our jail numbers are uh, among the lowest that they've been in years, and, um, and we're proud of that, and we think that our programs are a big uh, reason for that. Um, 
We are, the campaign is uh, going to be kicking off here soon. Sandra Brant's my campaign manager. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with her about anything that, uh, that we're doing, uh, pretty soon, uh, myself and Blythe and, um, I, you know, every, you know, we got two, two constitutional officers that don't have opponents and I'm grateful for them, but I know that they're going to join us, uh, when they can on the campaign trail, knocking on doors. Uh, and we're excited about that and getting the word out. Uh, I do have an opponent. He is, uh, going to be pushing for the Republican votes. That's not going to go anywhere uh, in Norfolk, uh, which is good news. And, um, you know, and we just we just need to make sure we're not taking this uh, lightly. Uh, Terry McAuliffe, as you guys have seen, I've, I was on a video with him uh, on a commercial forum. I'm very proud to have done that. He did a wonderful job for us last time he was governor and he's going to be a great governor again. But we we can't let up. You know, uh, Youngkin's going to pull out all the stops. And, uh, and we cannot afford to have Yunkin in there as governor. I'm just going to say that. I'm not, I'm not Terry's uh, spokesman. I just know what it means for Norfolk and uh, for Virginia. And with that, if anybody has any questions, I'll take questions. But otherwise, um, you, know, uh, you know, everything is moving full speed ahead. Uh, let, me, you know, let me just touch briefly. I know that, uh, you know, our former sheriff was found guilty uh, in uh, federal court. You know, and I just want to remind everybody that when I took over, you know, I made some promises. This is one is transparency. The other is behaving with integrity. Uh, and the other is respect at all times. I respect everybody. I've created relationships with every single person on our city council, all of our legislators. Uh, I maintain those relationships because I know they're important to the sheriff's office, but they're also important to the city of Norfolk. And, uh, you know, Every there, the we as Democrats have nothing to worry about about current leadership in the sheriff's office. Let me just say that. Yeah, and uh, so, anyways, I just wanted to touch on those things. If there's anything else that anybody I didn't touch on that somebody wants yeah. me to comment on, I will. Yeah, well, before I go to Fanal, uh, she probably wants to update on her campaign real quick, and then we'll get to the announcement. The only th request I have of you, Joe, can you do a yeah. panoramic? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You are in, in, well, in here, here's, the pool. here's the pool. Oh, yeah. And then here's look. Look at all the look at all the flowers. Yeah. <laughs> and the scenery. Well, hold on. I I, I got to get you to see Joy and Roshan. Uh, <laughs> so hold on. Yeah. Joy and Roshan. R Roshan is on the line. He's watching. But here's Joy. Joy's hiding. You know. But that's <laughs> <is. laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm a, there you yeah. go. But, but as you can see, all the way from Guatemala, we are uh, at the Dem Democratic uh, business, I mean, uh, breakfast, yeah. sharing our experience with you guys and making sure we're keeping you guys in touch. Good stuff. Thanks, Joe. What is the temperature, Sheriff? Oh, it's, it's probably right around 70 degrees right now. It's yeah. very nice. As you can see, yeah. I'm in a short sleeve shirt. Yeah. Uh, to the Guatemalans, yeah. though, uh, apparently this is chilly to them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Joe. Hey, uh, Fanal, you got uh, an update on what's going on with uh, in the hundred? Yeah, I do, and I and I know we're short on time, so I'll go really fast. But first, I just want to say a thank you to Congressman Scott for coming to my meet and greet. Uh, last week. That was really awesome. I wasn't expecting him, so it was a really great surprise. That must be the surprise they had for me. Um, and thank you to all labor, and I want to say special thank you to Doris. Thank you so much. The AFL-CIO endorsed me, so I am thrilled uh, to be supported by you guys, and I will certainly do my very best when I win. So, but here's what we have to do in order to win. So I actually have more ask than I do of, of, of announcements. So we have started uh, to canvas very heavily on the Eastern Shore, and we are also canvassing in Norfolk. We do have a regional director from the coordinated campaign, and we have a person uh, for Norfolk, and we also have one for the Eastern Shore. So that's really good news because we really have to hit the ground really hard. Now, uh, we had talked about a plan for District 100, and I will tell you, it got a little shaky start in terms of who we wanted to reach out to and how we wanted to reach them, but we're doing really great now. So let me tell you what this is. So aligning with the coordinated, Charlie, we talked about this, that we have across District 100, 
more than 5,000 voters who voted in 2020, but they did not vote in 2019. That is a really big number in terms of what we need to turn this race around. There are 40% turnouts on the Eastern Shore side, both North and Accomack County. Our turnout for District 100 on the North side is 26%. So when we talk about those 2020 voters who didn't vote in 2019, a big chunk of them are on the Norfolk side. So our plan is to continue to focus on that group of voters. They, these guys are not people who don't understand what happens. They're just busy. The, 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 the campaigns are typically low key. And so they just sort of, it falls off the radar. So if we touch and talk to them, they are not a hard push. And that's why canvassing is so important for the entire universe but it is majorly important for this universe. So when, when we look at those numbers, we can look across uh, our neighborhoods, our communities, and know where they are. So Suburban Park, Wesley Crossroads, Northside, Pretlow, what we're looking for is supporters in each one of those neighborhoods. If we can just find one or two, that helps us have a good relational strategy in terms of when you're knocking on doors, it's people that you know. And the doors that we're going to be knocking on, aside from the coordinated campaign, are these folks that we want to get out to vote. So that's one piece. And you guys can contact the campaign for information. Charlie, I'm happy to come back with a group of folks who are willing to help us. If you know someone in these neighborhoods, that's who we have to get to. The second piece is also phone calls. We have sister district. We have other groups that are actually making phone calls for us uh, across our entire universe. Now, keep in mind that when those phone calls happen, it is a very small percentage that you actually get to talk to, right? But they keep on because that's what they do. They're good at that. So, but what we want to do is focus on this 5,000. So when we talked before, we had the list. Now we have a link. So we can give you a link. You can take 15 minutes. You can take an hour. And you'll be making phone calls very specifically to this group of 5,000 voters who don't vote uh, in off-year elections very often, 2020 voters who voted in 2019. So um, I am looking for volunteers. I am looking for volunteers, or at least if you know people in different neighborhoods across our District 100, to put us in touch with those guys so they can help us canvas, have a quick meet and greet. Uh, the point is, we just got to get people enthused and motivated. And if we do that and they come out to vote, we win. And that's not just for our campaign for District 100. For those who have citywide elections, 26% gives you a nice cushion to go out if we can get those folks to vote. That's my thoughts. Thanks. Yeah, I sent out the uh, uh, mobilized link uh, uh, to everybody to have a chance to sign up and volunteer uh, for those. But uh, yeah, just have Gallery uh, continue to uh, uh, shoot me this uh, information and I can uh, make sure I get it out as best as, best as we can. Charlie? Yes, yes, Congressman. Uh, two, two things. On the Social Security that we had a discussion, um, I, I, was, I was thinking that a spouse could continue their um, a spouse's Social Security. I was thinking about a military sign-up. There's an option where you can um, uh, continue that, but that's a, that's a military thing, not a, um, uh, not a Social Security thing. So I'm going to keep that in mind as we go through, because I think the continuation of the full pay is something that uh, people might want an option. They would have to take a slightly lower benefit going forward, and actuarially, they could they could they could they'll be able to figure it out. And second, uh, when we go back, the speaker has promised to um, call a vote on a bill that would essentially codify Roe v. Wade. So that'd be one of the first things that we do when we come back. Yeah. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank uh, we're all. All right, uh, well, we're almost out of time here and I got three questions up there, uh, but from Guatemala, Rashawn. <laughs> hey, thanks. For, uh, just, well, first of all, I just want to say good luck to Fanal and everybody else that's running this year and I are working hard the next couple of months, but I think Joe forgot one announcement uh, with respect to the opioid epidemic. So if he's still on the call across the way, maybe he can chime in on that. Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, I apologize. Yesterday, the, I got word from the governor's office uh, that I have been selected to be on the Opioid Abatement Authority uh, as a board member. I'm very excited about that. As everyone knows, uh, the pharmaceutical companies were sued and uh, they, got, they, they are forced to uh, uh, 
award money to all the states, and then the states have to decide how to spend that money uh, towards uh, the uh, opioid that we, we have faced. Uh, and I'm proud to represent Norfolk. And if anybody has uh, anything that they want to pick my brain about or let me know about uh, in reference to uh, opioid issues and concerns, uh, I, my Charlie has my phone number. Actually, mm -hmm. I think everybody does, but yeah. I'm happy to listen. But I'm excited to be on that and to be appointed yes. by the governor. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. And, and I think it's a very important, I mean, we all know how big the problem is, but I can tell you, not firsthand, but secondhand, as a surgeon who prescribes opioids oftentimes and takes care of patients who have anything from uh, opioid addiction uh, to abscesses as a result of heroin actions uh, and things like that. This is a very important uh, initiative and that didn't obviously it could have been uh, there's a lot to debate about how it should have been handled with respect to Purdue etc but uh, this money is going to go to good use so yeah. we appreciate him being involved in that. Thanks for Sean. Uh, Betty you haven't uh, weighed in yet? Oh hi good morning everyone just really quick <clears throat> um, you can request your early uh, absentee ballot now uh, you don't have to wait until September 17th and uh, that's important uh, to do that now. We don't know what we're facing uh, prior to uh, the end of that voting period. Uh, we also will be doing absentee voting again in the Norfolk City Jail. But I wanted to announce next Saturday uh, on September 11th, this, there'll be a citywide neighborhood expo at Lakewood Park. So please come out. Uh, I'll be doing some uh, voter outreach uh, in that effort as well. So um, I'll talk more about voter protection in our business meeting. So go ahead now and request your absentee ballot. Um, you don't have to wait until September 17th. Right. Great. Um, and, and I think um, um, Christine Booth, you got a big event uh, coming up as well, correct? Yes. Um, thank you, Charlie, for allowing me to speak. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that um, I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Upsilon Omicron Omega Chapter. Our chapter, along with Alpha Phi Alpha um, Alpha um, Chapter, Alpha Phi Lambda Chapter in Norfolk, we're having our second virtual town hall and candidates forum. Um, as a result of last year's success reaching over 10,000 uh, viewers, we're having it on two separate dates. September 18th will be for local candidates in the Hampton Roads area. And the moderator will be Eric Cavill from Norfolk State University. And the September 25th will be the state candidates. And that will be, uh, the moderator will be Anita Blanton as of last, she did it last year. So we're breaking it up into two different Saturdays. Um, I wanna make sure that everyone received, all candidates received their RSVP. We did um, receive one from um, the Commissioner of the Revenue, like Scott, uh, Commonwealth Attorney, the City Treasurer, the Sheriff. We received um, RSVP from two candidates that are running for Super Ward 7, that's Philip Hawkins and Danica Royster. Um, the other candidates, have not responded as of today. It's still not um, too late. Um, and for the 25th, um, we have both candidates that are running for governor that are, that are participating. Um, also both candidates that are running for a lieutenant governor and um, attorney general as of Wednesday, we've only received uh, response from the Republican candidate. I will tell you, we are a, a nonpartisan organization, um, but this year, please note that we have received a lot of responses from Republicans, and um, as opposed to last year. So that's an inside thing. I just want to let people mm -hmm. know. Um, if you know somebody that's running that did not respond to the our letter of invitation, please give me a call. I'm gonna drop my number and um, email address in the chat. This year's format, we're taking questions from the community um, and asking those questions. What I'm telling you, I'm telling you this because you can ask these questions. I'm gonna forward all this information to Charlie when I receive it. Um, so you can have the link 
If you want a personal email, just let me know and I'll send it to you. But these questions can come from citizens of citizens of Norfolk mm -hmm. or anywhere. So I'm just giving you a heads up on that. Um, and that is it. If you have any questions, um, please give me a call. We're trying to get as many candidates um, here as possible. We did receive a lot of responses from um, um, House of Delegate um, candidates. So we do have a lot, both Democrat and Republican, and some other Democrats are on today. Um, so please give me a call if you have any questions, but this is gonna be very big. Um, I will advise you please to look for the link yeah. to participate. And like I said, please give me a call or email me if you want more information. All right, Christine, appreciate it. Yeah, and we'll, we'll blast that out uh, to try and uh, uh, drive up some participation. And now also reach out to Mark Herring's office to uh, make sure he gets uh, uh, on that uh, forum on the 25th. Okay. So I'll, I'll see what I can do and help you out there. Okay. Maybe they just haven't got around to it yet. Yeah, and that's and that's possible. And yeah. that's you know, and I, like I said, that's an update as of Wednesday. Um, yeah. I don't have that list. I have the local candidates, so you know, maybe yeah. you did, but if not, yeah. please tell them. Well, it's not I'll reach out. Yeah. Okay. All right. That. Okay. It, it's it's ten thirty five. Uh, we have intruded uh, uh, long. I know there's a couple more hands up, uh, um, but we, we we're just. We're just getting very, very long here. Um, uh, so is there another announcement? Uh, I know Ophelia normally has an announcement uh, of something. Uh, you got an event coming up, Ophelia? Just to remind everyone not to let Black Lives Matter fall off the radar screen. Every Thursday from 4.15 to 5.15, there's a vigil at the corner of Hampton Boulevard and 27th Street. We have signs for you to hold up for the traffic to see that we continue to encourage and endorse Black Lives Matter. Please join Thanks. us. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, Apila. And uh, Carrie, is this an announcement of an event? Yes. Um, yes, it's uh, actually, a, it's an announcement of the fact that the first, first uh, maps have started to be drawn and have right. been come out from the redistricting commission. So it, it is time to start to really pay attention to what is going on. Uh, the districts that the map drawers have made are very different looking from previous ones. It so far is only in the Northern Virginia section that they've drawn, but it, as it gets closer to us and where they end up drawing the lines, it is incredibly important and how they're doing certain things has a huge effect, uh, including, including um, they are counting people within, if they okay. are in mm -hmm. the prison system, they are being counted at their home residence as opposed to the prison, which should increase some of our representation here locally where the issues are really occurring. And it will also have some significant changes, I think, to district lines locally so that the 89th, 79th, and maybe the 100th, uh, right. no longer goes where it goes. Yeah. So. Well, I, re I recommend everybody uh, uh, visit VPAP, VPAP.org uh, uh, on their redistricting page. They're really good with the updates and it's uh, uh, a good resource. And then uh, Phil Hawkins, you got uh, an event coming up? Yes, I do. Um, thank you, um, Charlie, for letting me have a minute. I just wanted to let everybody know my campaign is alive and well. We're in the home stretch today to kick off the Labor Day weekend. We are hosting a public event. Um, it is for, um, it is a fundraiser. So um, I do have a donation link that I'll put in the chat. I think I've already done that through Act Blue, but we're gonna be at the Creative Design and Wellness Art Studio here on North Military Highway near Norview Avenue. It's right beside Mona Lisa's Pizza restaurant and bar, you can come to the rear, parking is in the rear, but we are doing a safe socially distanced activity. We are doing a drive-by fish fry and it is excellent 
cooking from the finest from the south side of Berkeley. And so please come out and support this event. We're also doing a paint sip and taste option for those who are vaccinated. We're asking you to wear your mask. We have a limit of 20 participants in the studio with um, creative art designer and educator from Norfolk Schools, um, Khadija Willis with creative design. So come to the rear. This is her entrance right here. We're going to have a drive around so you can just pick up a fish dinner and donate to Hawkins for Norfolk City Council. Right. Please get out and vote early. Thank you so much. All right, 12, uh, 1038. I, I apologize for the uh, uh, length of time, everybody. Um, but uh, thanks to all our elected officials and uh, candidates, uh, I appreciate it. And uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, end it, or at least stop the recording. Um, and you guys can uh, uh, stay on if you want. But uh, 